How many of you have been atheists for around 20 years or so? Around 20 years? A lot of people, awesome. Um, 10 years? 10 years, uh, less. Uh, five years? Okay, lots. Five years or less? Okay, just around one or two years. Okay, cool. So that's going to be related to what I'm talking about. I was originally supposed to talk about the state of secularism in the Philippines, but something happened that made me change my mind about the topic. It was a few months ago after one of our regular meetups, a new member approached me and offered his support. He was very enthusiastic. He said, if ever you need someone to have a shout off with a priest inside the church, I'm your guy. <laughs> and I told him, okay, but that's not quite how we do things at uh, Filipino Free Thinkers. But he was very insistent and he was very passionate. You could see from his expression. And he said, no, 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 even if you need someone to slap a priest inside the church, <laughs> I'm your guy. Okay, so, so I spent a, a good long time talking to him about more productive ways to channel all of that emotion and all of that anger. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. At first, I was worried. Maybe what I'm going to talk about will only be applicable to the one to two year people that, that I saw. And then I remembered one of the first meetings I had back when the movement started, or our movement as far as I'm concerned, 2009. I was talking to one of the more prominent old veteran atheists, atheist leaders at the time. And I, I talked to him about uh, the secular movement. And he said, yes, it's about time that we started getting together and burning churches. <laughs> okay, so okay, even, even old veteran atheists can use what I'll talk about uh, today. And I hope that uh, it's something that you can immediately apply um, in your own advocacy. Uh, Bill has already touched on this, how to engage with people in more productive ways. And I'm really interested to see what's, what was on that uh, video uh, that you talked about earlier. But I think it's similar to what I'll be talking about too. So it's very hard uh, to form um, atheist groups or atheist movements. Somebody already mentioned that it's like herding cats. And even within the community of fellow atheists and fellow agnostics, there was a lot of infighting. Before this got started, there were two groups that was originally one group because um, the leaders of both groups were fighting and it took a while to convince these people to come on, let's join the Filipino Free Thinkers and move on. And I'm glad that, uh, that now there's absolutely no infighting in the community anymore. Right? <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Yeah. No, absolutely no infighting in the community. Because there's a lot of anger, there's a lot of passion there, and that can lead to good things. You know, that can lead to, to, to movements. Movement gets started, you need that essential element of passion. But what anger can do is it can narrow our focus. We, we don't look outside the, the issue of religion anymore or religious people. And instead of uh, making us more open, uh, the issue of religion can become like blinders to us. Because a lot of us, especially the new atheists, when you're passionate, you think that you've been fooled all your life. You want to get away from religion as much as you can, as fast as you can, to dissociate from that. But, so my first bit of advice is not to do that. Remember as much as possible the feeling of being religious. The feeling of having a God to believe in, to lean on, and so on. Because um, it will teach you humility before you call other people delusional idiots. Remember that you were one of those too and you had good reasons for being a believer back then. Because only when we are humble can we have sympathy and empathy and these are good ingredients for communication to effectively happen. Right? But what about, uh, that's good for believers, right? But what about for the preachers or for the proselytizers and bigots who are always on your on your, in your face, the fear mongers, what do we do with them? Well, we should have compassion for them as well. They have the courage of their convictions. And if you really think about it, if you believe for a fact that non-believers and sinners are all going to spend the rest of their lives in hellfire and damnation, then it's only right that you proselytize, that you preach, 
So these people are trying to help us. They're trying to be good to us, and they're coming from good intentions. So we should all remember that. Uh, what we can learn from them as well is how not to do things. Because one of the problems that a believer has, that a bigot has, is they're married too much to their truths, to their dogmatic, fundamentalist truths. But when you lose those truths, you immediately look for new ones. So that's a danger for new atheists as well. We tend to latch on to our version. So in place of the religious doctrines or dogmas, there's, there are sort of liberal or progressive dogmas that cannot be questioned anymore. Um, I'll get to this uh, a bit more, but we also tend to replace our former religious idols with secular idols. So these people are perfect. They're the best people on earth. They cannot be questioned. So that uh, a lot of people immediately dismiss allegations of sexism, of elitism, of racism, and so on. But some of these are valid. Some of these are not. But you cannot just dismiss them outright because they've been hurled at someone that you really think is awesome. And um, some people go to extremes. Like I said, certainty is one of the things that religion offered. And um, People want to, to get that back, but in a secular version. So people are attracted to ideologies like objectivism, where everything has already been figured out, they have a handle on the truth, and, and so on. Some people, like they're disappointed, they thought they had the truth in religion, they don't have it anymore, so nobody can ever have the truth. So there are strains of postmodernism, uh, particularly epistemolog epistemological anarchy where they think no discussion or no seeking of truth is useful anymore because truth does not exist. So both of these are problems and they're problems of certainty because certainty tends to shut people up. It tends to stop discussion. A recent problematic trend that's been happening in the U.S is that in campuses, discussions on certain things such as LGBT rights, on feminism, has been stopped. Speakers have been disinvited or have been boycotted because people think that LGBT rights or feminism or whatever is already a settled issue. But there are no settled issues. It's true for science and it's true for ideas. We need to keep questioning these ideas because no one is immune to being wrong. Like, we can always find out later on that maybe uh, marriage equality was wrong all along. Le we don't want to shut people up or stop them from doing research on this. And if they're wrong, then so be it. We strengthen our position. Because even atheists can be wrong. A lot of atheists think that no, atheists cannot be wrong because atheists have higher IQs than their uh, religious counterparts. But I can tell you for a fact that I know a lot of atheists who are just plain idiots. And in the same way, a lot of believers are very, very smart. They're the smartest people I know. So it's not true that uh, people are necessarily smarter or dumber, but we should just get rid of this distinction altogether. We should stop creating more divisions and focus on what we have in common. We all hate suffering. We all want to live better lives. And how can we start from there? And instead of making religion or keeping religion a dividing line, you know, we keep criticizing uh, religious people of um, having religions that divide people instead of bringing them together. But a lot of secular people do that as well. You're religious and I'll stay away from you. And you know, a lot of people tend to blame religion for everything, for all of the ills in the world. There's more poverty, maybe it's because that country is religious. But as I have studied, I found out, um, I'm referring to, for example, stud studies by the people at the World Value Survey, um, Engelhardt in, and Dwelzel in particular. They found out that religion is more a symptom than a cause. When there's a lot of in, uh, existential inequality and poverty, religion tends to flourish. So it's not just religion. Religion is not the cause of all the ills of the world. Religion is not the only important issue that you could be involved in. There's, I, like I said, inequality, social injustice. There are a lot of minorities who are having a really hard time. And you should pay attention to those issues as well. It's not just about religion. Life is more complicated than that. And more importantly, people are more complicated than that. Too often when we're angry and we're new at this atheism thing, we think, okay, are you atheist or are you religious? Oh, you're, you're an atheist. Okay, you're my friend. You're, you're religious. You're my enemy. People have many sides to them, and if we focus too much on just whether they are religious, 
we're really missing out. Because we have a lot of common, like I said, with, with these religious people, and we have common goals as well. Uh, we, have, uh, we can advocate for the same things. We work with uh, groups like Catholics for Choice, like Catholics for Reproductive Health, to fight for RH law, for instance. We work with a lot of religious groups who fight for LGBT equality. We work with a lot of artists who, who fight for freedom of speech. And not all of them, not even majority of them, are atheists. Just think of the amount of work that you can do if you did not make religion your, you know, a dividing issue. You know, and how much can you do if you only, if you use that purity test? Are you religious or not? If you are, I'll work with you. If you're not, I won't. So, don't be a dick. This advice, you know, it started online, mostly for online games. When you, know, when you want to know how, how many people your mother has slept with, you play online games, right? And the advice, don't be a dick, was given because of people who do that, who are very mean online. But it applies to everything online. For some reason, when you're behind the monitor, when you're on a keyboard, and that's what a lot of new atheists do, you know? They, uh, it, it's actually a good thing if you can already go out into the streets and meet real people, but a lot of new atheists are stuck on their keyboards. They're stuck online. And when you're online, you tend to be meaner. You tend to forget that you're talking to actual people. So one issue or one controversy that recently happened, and there is some um, intersection between this issue and the atheist or secular community in the US as well, is Gamergate. Are you familiar with the issue of Gamergate? Right, so people were really mean on both sides of the issue. Right? So there were accusations that, was, that there was uh, a lot of sexism and a lot of uh, misogyny um, in the male gamers. And to prove women wrong, what the, what the men did was harass women even more. So that just doesn't make any sense at all. On the other side of the issue, there are some social justice warriors who tried to give them what they were getting. So they were getting bullied, so they bullied back the other side. And I think that's just not productive. And this adage should be remembered by people, not just online, but everywhere. So it's Hanlon's razor, never attribute to malice that it, which is adequately explained by stupidity. So you think that someone's trying to be mean to you, they think that they really want to harm you, but uh, what's happening in fact is just they, they don't see the same things that you do. So what do you do? You show them patiently, right? It's not an us versus them kind of thing. It's not black and white. There are many sides to people. There are many sides to an issue. And if you really want to convince someone, the best way to do that is often not by force, not by brute force. We all, of course, remember the, the famous fable where the more effective way to do things is often through warmth and compassion. And that applies um, not only to, to physical things, but in, in terms of convincing people as well. Of course, we also have to realize that there comes a time when we have to agree to disagree, to realize that the other side won't be engaged with. And the best way to deal with them is to listen to their side, keep calm, not doing anything, but keep a camera. So one thing that happened to us was we came to one of their events and we were recording and they were harassing us and we caught it all on video. We ca caught a pro-life group um, saying as we were leaving, you tell your mother to abort you. So the hypocrisy was displayed for everyone to see. And uh, that's how you deal with people who harass you. You don't harass them back. You don't physically slap them or shout at them. You just write about it or record it. So other than picking the way we engage with people, it's also important to pick the battles, pick your battles in the first place. You shouldn't argue with everyone who is wrong online. You shouldn't pick on everyone who you think is picking on you. Because you don't want to burn yourself out. A lot of new atheists have so much energy. You know, after meetups, I recognize these people, they approach me, they say they want to do things. And then a few months later, I don't see them anymore. It's just they, they fizzle out. You have to be in this for the long haul if you are to be effective at all. And one way to do that is to pick your battles. But of course, um, it's not, it's not a, a bad thing to want to fight. In fact, it's very nice to be an atheist activist 
in the Philippines. Free thought, uh, atheism, is more fun in the Philippines. We are, we are safe here, and we even get recognized. Um, I, I've been in several TV shows. They're fine with my atheism. We've even received awards for, for the secular work that we do. And more importantly, we don't get murdered here, like in other places. Um, the artist Mideo Cruz had this on, the, on a display at the CCP. And the worst that he got was threats of violence and violence on his work of art. Somebody took down the, the phallus and I think burned it or yeah, set fire to it. But as far as Mideo, Mideo is concerned, he's still okay. Of course, there are people like Carlos Eldran who is facing a, a, a case. Uh, but we're bringing that up to the Supreme Court and we will... We, we will see what happens, but at the very least, he's alive and healthy, and I don't think there's, he's under any threat of physical violence. We should remember how fortunate we are. Somebody already mentioned this several times, but in many places all over the world, you are at risk for being an atheist. There are 13 countries where you could get the death penalty just for being an atheist, and we already know of the many examples when criticizing religion can cause you harm. Uh, in Singapore, where I'm speaking next month, I think, they're requiring the, uh, a visa, a, a work visa, so that they can censor the stuff that I say there. For saying some stuff on Facebook against Lee Kuan Yew and Jesus, uh, this kid, is, uh, Amos Yee, is, you know, will potentially go to jail. My friend, Alexander Aan, actually went to jail and we have an interview with him that's still embargoed until the lawyers say it's okay for us to publish the stuff that he said against the Indonesian government. And uh, at least these people are still alive. We've already, we already know that several bloggers, atheist and humanist bloggers, have died for their advocacy. So there's a lot that we can do. There's a lot of passion there. But it's best that we really think about how we use this more productively. Um, it's a kindness that we can do for those who can't. Uh, thank you very much. Questions here coming from members of the audience. Let's get, get the ball rolling. Okay, here's one question. Pondering our nations on our nation's current state and culture depresses me. Um, it feels like we're regressing, says uh, one member of the audience. Do you think there's still hope or are we effed? <laughs> what do you think can trigger a cultural renaissance? Uh, first of all, I disagree with that. I think that um, stuff is getting better, not only in the Philippines, but um, around the world. Uh, I think that, that your being depressed and complaining about the state of things in the Philippines is actually a sign of a progressing culture. Like There has been research done that shows that as like, things like democracy improve, people tend to complain more and ob uh, subjectively think that their governments are, are worse. So I think that the Philippines is actually getting better. Uh, I, I, can't, I don't think you can call like, events like this a sign that stuff is regressing. Like 10 years ago, how many atheist conferences that did we have? Uh, zero. Um, how many atheists did we have on TV? or receive uh, awards from, from prominent bodies? Zero. So things are improving, and if there is to be a cultural renaissance, I think uh, it's already happening. Uh, and you can only do your part. Uh, a lot of speakers here have already given practical advice on how you can do that, and just uh, check what you can do and do your best to contribute in that way. For the next question, all right. <laughs> all right. In a nutshell, what is the state of the secularism in the Philippines? Are we seeing significant, uh, are, we, are we seeing significant or slow increase in the growth, in the growth of secu uh, secularists? RH law. That's all. Okay, that's it. It's very significant that we now have an RH law. The Catholic Church really tried to bend over backwards and whatever metaphor you can think of to fight the RH law, but they failed. Divorce is going to be easier. There's no money involved there. Um, we are working on an abortion campaign, 
and we're you know we're going to try to to get the the stigma at least on abortion uh, removed decriminalization of uh, abortion in some cases as for starters and more ethical treatment of people who have performed abortions as well um, what else on their death checklist um, euthanasia uh, marriage equality all of those things will will soon follow it's just it's like dominoes uh, there were people were saying when the CBCP was saying if we pass the RH law so many other things will follow and we were saying no that's the slippery slope fallacy but actually it's not a fallacy the RH law is fast so I can say that now uh, <laughs> sorry guys yeah everything else will follow death bills uh, yeah you've been had <laughs> all right thanks you okay Last? all right so next can you consider secularism a political movement in our country yeah it's definitely a political movement uh, the secularism is indeed enshrined in our constitution and a lot of people have changed their tone on secularism now the more common argument that a politician would make um, as far as uh, biblical issues is concerned like for example homosexuality or RH contraception they would say actually some other part of the Bible can be interpreted in a way that says it is okay Right? That was the more common default argument that people would make before. But more and more politicians, uh, legislators, and public officials are now saying secularism. State and, state and church should be separate. We have a president who says that he's a leader, not just of Catholics, but of all religions. So it's a political movement. A lot of, uh, of legislators, most notably in the Senate, we have Miriam Santiago, Pia Cayetano. Uh, in, the, in the lower house, there are several as well. Uh, too many to mention, but people are taking it on, and uh, I think the next move is to is to make it a movement by itself. Mm -hmm. Like um, we were close to having that when one legislator suggested that religious displays and celebrations should be banned from public places. Mm -hmm. uh, that was Mong Palatino, but unfortunately he withdrew because of the the amount of damage that it would have cost uh, his political career or his, his party's political career. But something like that is the next step because so far, secularism has been integrated but never really the main thing. Okay, follow-up question coming from me about that. So, could it, since that you mentioned that it's a political movement, would it, would, with that said, can it polarize the, uh, the, popu uh, the population of the Philippines? Uh, considering that we are a dominant uh, uh, do, uh, Christian dominated country definitely definitely yeah definitely it would polarize uh, the country uh, but so what right um, a lot of people I think mistakenly ask the question is the Philippines ready for this or that is they are they ready for secularism for marriage equality for abortion etc that's I think a useless question if you really need it if people have the right to it, it doesn't matter if everyone else is ready. You should fight for it immediately. And of course, there's stra strategic things to think about, but, uh, but it should get started as soon as possible. Uh, there is another question coming from uh, one of the audience. Uh, he's asking, what, wouldn't you, uh, would you want to run for Congress or for Senate to become the first atheist politician in the country? Would you want to do that? Okay, um, I was actually thinking about that, but so, but um, the the pork barrel scam was already exposed, so I wouldn't gain any money from. I need money, guy. No, I'm kidding. Uh, if it, I think, uh, sure, why not? If um, right now we're we're busy on working on RH implementation, so we've go we've been going around um, educating people on RH empowering them capacity building and so on but if an opportunity arises for a political party that's focused on secular stuff um, i wouldn't be opposed to it and last question okay how do you f uh, how do you define being a bandwagoner or you know or to be to be exact a bandwagon a bandwagon atheist or secularist uh, this was already mentioned a while ago uh, by david and i think that's uh, that is a problem uh, that the, that bandwagon kind of thinking uh, we at Filipino Freethinkers are more concerned with 
the, your way of thinking or how you reach conclusions rather than the conclusions themselves. So it's better to, to teach someone how to question or, and how to think rather than what to think. You know, like, uh, but of course, if, if, you, if you at first believed something and you believed because of the bandwagon, it's, it's not too late. You can still question and check your beliefs. It's something that everyone should do. Uh, again, the danger is to think that I've got everything figured out already. Like, you shouldn't have that attitude. Like, everyone should be open to learning um, in any aspect, not just religion.